Good morning, everyone. So, um, yeah, we're on this uh, shortened schedule this week. Um, the shortest uh, will be Tuesday and Friday, um, but um, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, at least we have 30 minutes in most classes. I know fourth period, we're always going to have a little bit longer because of lunch. OK. Um, just want to review a little bit with um, our calendar. Friday, we went over worksheet three. We started worksheet three, but uh, there's still a few uh, integral topics that I want to spend time going over, uh, such as second theorem, applications of first theorem. Um, if we have time, maybe uh, I want to do uh, area of volume, and if we have time, we'll also do uh, uh, differential equation. Um, so I'll spend time doing that uh, today. Um, there's also worksheet four. So worksheet four is just over linear approximation and um, derivative inverse at a point. Um, I'm probably not going to have a chance to go over it, but um, uh, if you guys can, yeah, it's just uh, this assignment is only two pages, so uh, all the other assignments are four pages, but this is a short one, so just two pages that you guys picked up. Uh, tomorrow uh, we'll do a uh, test review for multiple choice section, and then um, uh, and if you come in uh, into the classroom on Wednesday, I will also have a, a test review for uh, Thursday. Uh, which is the um, over integral topics. So uh, normally this would just be one test um, over a full class period, but because of this week, I split into two separate days. Um, and so one through eight, uh, you have 30 minutes to do eight multiple choice questions. Um, I'll be asking that you show your work um, for the problems that require work. And then um, 9 through 16 on Thursday, over um, the integral topics. OK, because of the our, our shortened periods um, um, and probably me not being able to go through um, the test review worksheets that I'll give you guys tomorrow. And those test reviews are already up on the website. I'm working on the keys. Uh, hopefully I can get those in um, later today. But uh, because of that, I want to have help sessions uh, in the afternoon. I can't hold them in the morning because I um, got to do EOCs and or prep for EOCs um, administration. So uh, but I will have afternoon starting this afternoon, 3.30 to 4.30. Um, so today I may go over um, more of worksheet four. Yeah, so. Maybe I'll go over mainly worksheet three and four, and then tomorrow I'll go over um, test review worksheet five, and then Wednesday I'll go over test review worksheet six. Any questions with our uh, schedule this week? All right, so uh, if you guys can turn to worksheet three. This is from Friday. So we did Riemann sums. Um, we did first theorem, uh, second theorem rather. We did uh, second theorem. And we'll switch over. To, let's go over to the second page. And I want us to do a little bit more uh, with second theorem. 
So we'll look at six, seven, and eight. Zoom in a little bit. All right, so number six uh, says, let the function be defined by f of x um, on which of the following interval is the graph concave down. So if we're thinking concave down, hopefully uh, we recognize that as a something involving the second derivative. So let me list out what we're going to be our plan of action here, and then we can apply it for this particular problem. We know we have to find our way to the second derivative function. We know we have to find critical points, so we're going to find f double prime. We're going to set it equal to zero. We're going to find our critical points. Uh, we're going to populate our f double prime sign line. And then from there, we're going to test our intervals, right? Um, if it's positive um, with the test point, we know it's concave up. If it's negative in that region, we know it's concave down. All right, so there's our plan of action. That's how we're going to get to um, finding our interval of concave down. So uh, we have to find f double prime. That means we first have to get to f prime first. However, um, this is a little strange, right? This is not just a polynomial where we can just do power rule twice. It's the integral. The function is defined as the integral of this polynomial, which means that f of x right now is not sitting at this 2t cubed level. It's sitting one degree above it. OK, we don't have to find the integral to get to that point. We just have to understand that the function we're dealing with is sitting up at this level. So that means if I find the derivative of an expression that's one degree higher, if I find the derivative of this function, it's going to bring me down to this level, this 2t cubed. So when we find the derivative of this expression, we're not going to have to rely on power rule. We just have to remove this notation, and that's f prime right there. Okay. okay so we're essentially we're uh, applying second theorem to get to the first derivative. So I want to kind of show you the notation. Because if I want to find the derivative, I have to find the f, if I want to find f prime, I'm going to be taking the derivative of this expression. So f prime is going to be a lot less work than we normally would have to do because we really, we only have to just replace the x in for the t's and then just remove the d over dx and integral. So your f prime is going to look a lot like the function that you have with just with that integral removed. OK, any questions so far? f prime is just this expression here. We didn't have to do power rule to get to f prime. Okay, well, we have to keep going, right? Because we're trying to get down to information about concavity, so we have to find f double prime. Now, to get from f prime to f double prime, now we'll use power rule, right? Okay, so. Now we can set f double prime equal to zero, factor, solve for x. Those will be our critical points. Okay, multiplies to be six, adds up to be negative five. Negative two and negative three. 
Okay, so we have our um, critical points. We're going to place them onto our F double prime sine line. Two and three, we'll populate those onto the sine line. I'll choose values in each interval, so I'll choose one, I'll choose 2.5, and I'll choose four. Okay, I'm going to test each interval or each value within each interval with second derivative, and there's different variations of second derivative that we created, but the one you want to test is the factor form. This is going to be the fastest one that will allow you to quickly um, gather information about positive and negative without having to enter in your, into your calculator. So I'll enter one in for X. One minus two is negative. One minus three is negative. Negative times negative is positive. Okay, 2.5 in for X. That's positive times negative. So it's negative. Okay, enter four in for X, positive. Four minus three is also positive. Right, so we're looking for concave down, so now it's pretty easy to spot, right? Just that interval from two to three. Any questions here? All right, anybody still need this page? All right, here's number seven. Uh, number seven is asking for the derivative of a definite integral from zero to two x of natural log of an expression. So anytime I see a notation where derivative and integral are stacked next to each other, I know this is second theorem. So um, this is your second theorem formula. We're just going to line everything up. All right. So my P of X is that 2X. My F of T is that natural log of TQ plus 3. All, I know that ultimately what's going to happen is the derivative and integral will just naturally just cancel each other out. We're not going to have to find the derivative of this expression. This f of t that you see is going to largely remain unchanged. OK, so no derivative, no integral going on. All we're doing is we're just taking that upper bound, inserting it into the variable of, of the expression. And then we multiply it by the upper bounds derivative, but that's it. So this f of x is not going to change. We don't have to do u prime over u or anything like that. We're just following what the rule says. Okay. So I'm going to jump right into it. I know the derivative and integral, they're just going to take itself out. That 2x is just going to find its way to be inserted into the t of my expression. And then I can worry about that upper bounds derivative. OK, so. I'm going to start my process here. Natural log of t gets replaced with 2x, but that cube is going to have to be involved there. Times the upper bounds derivative. So 2x becomes 2. Okay, do a little bit of cleanup. 2 cubed and x uh, 2x, 2 and x are both cubed. Okay. So that's basically our answer. Uh, just be careful here. This 2 um, cannot merge with this 8x cubed plus 1. This is inside the natural log. The best we can do is just push that 2 out in front of that natural log.
Answer choice D. All right, questions? Okay, number eight. Uh, we have f of x is 2 sine of e to the t over 2. This is going to be a calculator question. It says g is the antiderivative of f. So I'm going to underline that, and we're going to explore what that means. So I'm going to just write out exactly what it says here. It says g is the antiderivative of f. Now, if we have this in front of us, we need to understand what this means. That the, the relationship here is that this f is really sitting at the g prime level. Okay? Because in order for f and g to be equal, I got to take the integral of f in order to make it equal. So right now, f is sitting at a degree below. So we know that um, f is really g prime. Also, you can do this. You can take the derivative of both sides. G becomes G prime. The integral of F will just be just F. OK, so this is the relationship we have to understand. Okay. So that means this function that I see in front of me is really my G prime. Okay. And we have to understand that with, you know, uh, without them um, um, being explicit about it, they may they only have to say this statement in order uh, for that connection to be true. OK, so I have something that is G prime. I have a, a point, a, a given point on the function, and then I'm asked for G of three. So I like to think of this as a variation of that first theorem. That final equals initial plus displacement. OK, and if you look at your formula sheet, there's a lot of variations of it. Right. You can think of it as f of b equals f of a plus integral of f prime. It could be uh, between position and velocity. It could be a relationship between f prime and f double prime. It could be a relationship between velocity and acceleration. All right. So all these variations of a uh, first theorem. We're just going to I'm going to write out. So that's my um, formula, and I'm just going to adapt it for my problem here. I want to find g of 3 equals g of negative 1 plus the displacement, the progress between the two points. And we know the g prime is just this f of x that we have in front of us. Okay, replace g of negative 1 with negative 2. And just enter this expression. Okay, the rest can just go into our calculator.
OK, any questions here? All right, anybody still need this? All right, next page. Uh, <clears throat> number nine is just a um, um, use substitution problem that you guys can try on your own. Number 10 and 11 are just more of what we did with number eight. Um, final equals initial plus displacement, but then in terms of velocity or in terms of or in terms of position and velocity and in terms of velocity acceleration. So just practicing those variations and just getting comfortable and just recognizing uh, when to be uh, using those types of formulas. 12 is another use substitution. Uh, you guys can try that on your own. Uh, 13 is differential equation. I think if I have time at the end, I want to come back to this. Um, but you know, you guys have done so much of this recently. Um, I'm going to skip this for now, but I do want to go to the back page and focus our time with area volume. Um, it was the very last unit that we covered, um, but you know, we've been doing so much AP review that I don't want to. I want to make sure that we don't forget those process of uh, this method, washer method, cross section. OK, so let's go to the last page and spend our efforts on those on reviewing those concepts. All right, so let's do um, let's do 15 through 17, and if we have time, we can hit the other ones as well. OK, all right, so 15. OK, so 15. Fifteen reads. Uh, the base of a solid is the region enclosed by the graph of y equals sine of x squared and the x-axis between the uh, intervals of zero and root pi. If the cross section of the solid perpendicular to the x-axis are squares, what is the volume of the solid? Okay, first things first. Let's figure out what our shaded region looks like. So I'm gonna go to my calculator and graph this y equals sine of x squared. I know my bounds, so that's good. That can help us adjust our windows. So go to y equals sine of x squared. Make sure you're in radian mode. Go to y equals. I'm just going to go from negative one to um, I, I typed in root pi and it came out to be 1.77, which is converted that to a decimal for me. I had it from negative 10 to 10, but I already graphed it and it's it ends up being really um, hard to see, but I guess not a big deal because we're not we're not going to have to do any type of tracing. But um, if you want to see things a little bit clearly, um, it's a tr process of a uh, trial and error and just trying to get the graph a little easier to look at. But negative 10 to 10 was a, was really tiny and this is a little better, but but we don't have to worry about um, finding the intersections, right? The intersection is already given to us, so just have to have an idea as to what the graph looks like. OK, so there's my shaded region between the graph and the x axis from zero to root pi. OK, so uh, the next step is to figure out what direction do we draw our base, right? Is it going to be perpendicular or sorry, is it going to be vertical or horizontal? We never have to guess, OK? They always are going to tell you explicitly how to draw it. So we want uh, the cross section is perpendicular to the x-axis. So let's think about where that is. X-axis is horizontal. Perpendicular to it, so that must mean that we're going to have to draw our base vertically. Right? So just draw your base vertically. And if you draw your base vertically, your base length vertically, you know that it's going to be top minus bottom. If it's top minus bottom, it's easier because the expressions given to you should be already ready to go. OK, so first things first, I'm going to build my base length, just top minus bottom. 
top of my base length is sitting on the curve. Bottom of my base length is sitting at the zero. So there's my base. Next up, we have to figure out what is the shape that we want to build. The shape that we want to build are squares. And if you look on your formula sheet here, and eventually you want to commit this to memory because um, on the AP exam, you're not going to have it, but um, air squared is just base squared. But in truth, um, on the AP exam, uh, I don't see the other shapes as much. Uh, if you see cross section on your AP exam, chances are it's going to be a square. It's going to be something involving square. They tend not to have these obscure rules as much. So base squared, I'm going to adapt this formula for my specific problem. Okay, so we have our area specified, and now we should have to figure out uh, our uh, cross-section formula. Your cross-section formula is always going to look like this. It's just the integral from your bounds, and then you're just going to fit the area dx. If it's top minus bottom, if it's right minus left, then it's area of the cross section dy. Okay. And I should put x1, x2. I'm just writing a formula here and we're going to adapt it. So we're going to insert the area that we found. The area and the DX, the DX is going to give it that third dimension, so it's going to give us that volume. Remember, there's no pi in front, right? There's no rotation. There's no circle involved here. So we're just going to go from zero to root pi. Our area, DX. And the rest is going to go in our calculator. Okay, math nine. Okay, 0 0.6698, that rounds up to be 0 0.670. Answer choice A. Okay, any questions with cross section? Right, you guys can practice um, the similar problem or similar uh, concept here with number 14. But we'll skip to, we'll go down to 16. All right, here's 16. Uh, let R be the graph enclosed by Y equals 4 over X and Y equals 5 minus X. You can enter this in the calculator, but I'm just going to graph it. I know that uh, this is going to look like 1 over X. I know that 1 over X is just going to be a rational function that looks like this. But it's just going to be a, a steeper version of this 1 over X. And I know 5 minus X is just a linear graph. Uh, with the y-intercept of 5 and the slope of negative 1. OK, so I'm just going to draw this freehand here. So 4 over x, I'll make this a little steeper. 5 minus x, 
one, two, three, four, five, with a slope of negative one. Okay, that's what I can expect from my shaded region. All right, so the volume of the solid, we know we're revolving. So anytime we're rot rotating, we know it's going to have to be either disc or washer. There's going to be circle, uh, circular based uh, shapes coming out of it. Okay, so we're rotating about the y axis. That's our axis of revolution. So I'm taking that shaded region, I'm rotating it about that vertical line. So disc or washer method? Oh, washer. washer method, right? There's no flat surface up against that shader, up against that axis. So um, even if it's touching, uh, even if it's touching the curved region, it's still going to be washer, right? But here's more obvious. This is a complete uh, a gap. OK, so I'll write that down here, washer. Okay. Which means we've got to draw two radius extending from the axis to the uh, boundaries of our shaded region. Top minus bottom or right minus left? Right minus left. And that should be a red flag in the sense that if it's right minus left, I know there's some additional effort required. My, the equations that I'm working with most likely are not in the correct form. I got to spend the time to rewrite these equations. So these equations, y equals 4 over x and y equals 5 minus x, are not in the proper form. OK, so I'm going to spend time to rewrite them. So start off with the y equals 4 over x. To get that in the appropriate form, I can cross multiply, solve for x. x equals 4 over y. So I know that 4 over y is referring to the curve, so I'm just going to point an arrow to it. Next up, that uh, y equals 5 minus x. If I solve for x, x is equal to 5 minus y. That's the linear graph. Okay, so I'm going to draw my two radius, one that extends from the axis to the furthest boundary and one that extends from the axis to the closer boundary. There's my big R. Okay, and my little radius extends from the axis to the closer here. So all of our uh, radius, big R and little r, will all involve these um, equations. Let's build our two radius here. Big radius, right minus left, right end point of my um, big radius sitting at the phi minus y on the linear, and the left end point is sitting at the zero, so phi minus y minus zero. Okay, little radius, right minus left. The right end point is sitting on the curve. The curve is the 4 over y, so 4 over y minus 0. Okay, we know that we're working with uh, our washer method formula, uh, but we still need to find our bounds, right? Our bounds have still not been found. You can use your calculator and just go to those intersections if you like, but I'm going to solve it by hand. Um,
And I think it's good. I think it's good for you guys to practice both ways. Um, make sure that you know how to get into the calculator, but also you want to practice working this out by hand, because um, this, I think this is technically part of a non-calculator section. So, I mean, it's not going to be a, uh, a big deal on my pre-AP test, but on the AP exam, you're going to have to do this by hand without um, potentially without having a calculator in front of you. Okay, so intersections, I'm going to set my two equations equal to each other and solve for y. Oops, sorry, four for y equals. Cross multiply. Distribute the y through. I'm going to bring everything over to one side. Factor. Multiplies to be 4, adds up to be negative 5. So we know our bounds are an extend from one to four. And I'm running out of room here, so I'm just going to put this on a separate sheet here. I know I'm going to be filling in this information into my volume formula. My bounds from 1 to 4, big R is 5 minus Y, little r is 4 over Y. Answer choice C. All right, any questions here? All right, let's do one more. Last one here, number 17. Right. Uh, what is the volume of the solid generated when the region bounded by the graph x equals square root of y minus 2 and the lines x equals 0 and y equals 5 revolve about the y-axis? Let's figure out what this graph looks like. I know it's kind of tough to figure out um, what that is. Um, I like to maybe I want to solve in terms of y so I can just get something that's more familiar to me. So. Um, Going to rework this equation just so I can have some an easier time visualizing my graph. But if I square both sides, I can kind of make my way to solving for y. Okay, the square root goes away. I add two to both sides. All right, so this is more familiar, right? We know what y equals x squared plus 2 looks like. It's just a parabola with y intercept at 2. However, um, it's only coming from that positive square root. So that tells us that as we draw our parabola, it's really only referring to that portion in the first quadrant. So this is what the full parabola looks like. But we're only talking about this portion here. Okay, we have another boundary, x equals 0. That's the y-axis. We have another boundary, y equals 5. That's going to be a horizontal line. There we go. There's our shaded region. All 
We're going to take that shader region. We're going to rotate it about the y-axis. Let's draw that dotted line. All right, if we can get this picture in front of us, we should be able to identify which method here, disk or washer. This is going to be disk, right? We see that flat surface right up against that shader region. All right, we really need to be able to have a graph in front of us to be able to to get a good feel for which method we're using, right? OK, so this method. OK, top minus bottom or right minus left? Right. Yeah, still right minus left. We we're, um, we have a vertical axis. Uh, we have to extend our radius uh, from the axis to our shaded region. To the boundary. Normally, I would say, oh, we need to rewrite our equation, but it looks like the equation that's given to us is already perfectly suited for right minus left. So in this case, we didn't have to rewrite it, but we did rewrite it just so that we can get some idea, some better feel for the shape of the graph. But then once we are there, we don't have to rewrite the equation. It's perfectly set up for us in this case. OK, so big R. The right endpoint is sitting on the curve. The curve is the root y minus 2. The left endpoint is sitting on the y axis, which is 0. So just root y minus 2 minus 0. Our bounds. The nice thing about this problem is we can pick off the bounds without having to go through our calculator. We can just see that the lowest y value is 2, the high y, highest y value is 5, so we know we can go from 2 to 5. This method is just radius squared. Okay, the rest goes in your calculator. Remember that uh, even if you see Y's in your expression, you're only entering X's into your calculator. So normally we would say 4.5 pi, but if we look at our answer choices, looks like pi is incorporated into the uh, decimal. Multiply by pi. 14.137. Okay, questions? Okay, so again, uh, help session this afternoon. This afternoon, I'll probably spend most of the time going over worksheet three and four. Um, for those of you who want to see some more problems with uh, linear approximation and um, 
derivative inverse at a point, which I probably won't be able to get a chance to go through in class tomorrow. Our class is even shorter. Um, uh, and then um, tomorrow afternoon, I'll go over test review worksheet number five. I'll do some of it in class, but um, uh, we probably need to have more time. So I'll have that as a review during review session. And then Wednesday, I'll go over worksheet six, which is over um, topics for Thursday's portion. All right, have a great day, everyone. See you guys tomorrow.